Hey everyone, good morning. My name is Beth Ferris from Brookings. I'm a senior fellow here and co-director of the Brookings LSE project on internal displacement. I'd like to welcome all of you here and also those who are watching via webcast. I apologize in advance for my hoarseness. Like most of Washington, I'm recovering from a cold and anyway. But this, uh, at this session, we're going to be looking at assessing humanitarian response, looking back at the crises of 2013. It was a terrible year for humanitarian crises between Syria and the Central African Republic, Hurricane, I mean, Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, South Sudan toward the end of the year. And these crises came on top of an already long list of ongoing humanitarian emergencies mostly have fallen off the front pages, but you know, Darfur is still there and there are still difficulties in Democratic Republic of Congo and perhaps a hundred other places. So it was a tough year for humanitarians and we've got a distinguished panel today to talk about this. Um, this, this session is being jointly organized with Médecins Sans Frontières or Doctors Without Borders. They're the same organization and we're glad to have Sophie with us representing MSF. MSF, of course, has been a, an NGO with years of experience working in some of the most difficult conflict situations in the world, and so we're honored that we're doing this together. What we're going to do is I'm going to briefly introduce the panelists and then turn to them to have a discussion. Then we'll have a little conversation among ourselves with any questions that emerge before turning it over to questions and answers. We'll begin with Antoine Gerard, on the, my far um, left, who's the Deputy Director of Coordination and Response Division at the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, UN OCHA. He has a long history of humanitarian work in lots of different countries. You, you've seen their complete bios in the packets you have. He's worked with um, MSF before joining um, OCHA in various countries such as Sudan, Yemen, and the occupied Palestinian territories. We'll then turn to Sophie Delaunay, who's the executive director of Médecins Sans Frontières here in the U.S. She, too, has worked a lot in the field as well as at headquarters in France and the U.S. Then we'll look at the role of the International Committee for the Red Cross with Francois Stem, who's the head of the regional delegation for the U.S. and Canada here in Washington. You look at the list of countries where he's worked, and indeed, if you add up all the countries where these people have worked, it's quite impressive. Francois has worked in Geneva and U.S. as well as Cambodia, Philippines, Zambia, Somalia, Zimbabwe, Malawi, Kosovo, Montenegro, Serbia, and Macedonia. And finally, we'll turn for a human rights perspective to Ian Levine, who's Deputy Executive Director for Program of Human Rights Watch and has been a keen observer of humanitarian crises and human rights violations around the world for many years. So we're glad you're here and we're particularly happy to welcome all of you to Brookings to talk about these important issues and, and look forward to hearing your insights about how we did as an international community in 2013. Antoine, over to you. Thank you, Beth, and uh, indeed, I mean, 2013 has been pretty much challenging, so um, it was a real task for uh, the global humanitarian system, and unfortunately, there's no indication that 2014 is going to be as uh, any different. So um, the past uh, year uh, was marked by the international community's massive effort uh, to ease the suffering in water on Syria and typhoon hit Philippines, two types of crises and a very different uh, scope. And of course, amid sectarian fighting in both Central African Republic and South Sudan. So there are those four contexts that I would like to, to uh, come back now. So in Central African Republic, uh, we're witnessing a complete collapse of state authority and uh, inability to lead a national political process accepted by all parties. In this environment, the humanitarian community uh, remains deeply concerned that the civilian population is bearing the brunt of violence and being victims of inter internal communal tension. So concerns have been expressed regarding the capacity of uh, international forces on the ground to stabilize the situation and provide the adequate protection to the Central African people. Even with additional international support, uh, MISCA's ability to stabilize the situation in CAR is doubtful at best. Member states are deliberating at the United Nations, I mean, the next step, including if and when to transform MISCA into a UN peacekeeping operation. And it is important that uh, security and political stability are the core functions of this new setup to avoid the confusion with a humanitarian agenda. So in absence of agreement in core regarding the future of the country, 
The imaging committee has been mobilized to support creative ways to operate in, in, uh, um, in the country. And, excuse me, I just have my... And then we have uh, faced serious challenges, in particular around security and logistics. The humanitarian response has not kept pace, and we recognize that, with the rapid deterioration of the situation on the ground, it has not met the needs of all. Many people, including most vulnerable, continue to hide in the forest and in the remote areas with extreme poor sanitary conditions and without access to basic services and clear water. So in order to better mobilize the international community and to contribute to the context analysis, a better overview of what is done by humanitarian actors operating in CAR is needed to make a compelling case to member states and also uh, to make a case to the African regional organizations to increase their support for humanitarian action. It is important that we keep the world's attention on CAR, particularly on the people's needs for assistance and protection. Uh, and this could be done through a constructive advocacy and information strategy. Let me turn to Syria, because 2013 continued to be a challenging year for Syria. In the course of the year, the conflict resulted in the rapid deterioration of the humanitarian situation. People in need of assistance inside Syria more than doubled from 4 million at the beginning of the year to 9.3 million today. In absence of agreement regarding the future of the country, the humanitarian community has been mobilized to support creative ways to operate in Syria and also engage the key member states of the region and the Security Council to deliver against their obligations and responsibilities to alleviate the sufferer. On the 2nd of October of last year, the UN Security Council endorsed a presidential statement to improve the humanitarian situation in Syria. The statement called on parties to respect their obligation to protect civilians and civilians' infrastructure and abide to the, by the rules of international human and human rights laws. In order to assist the implementation of this presidential statement of the United Nations Council, in November 2013, the Emergency Relief Coordinator Valerie Amos established a high-level group on humanitarian challenges in Syria, aimed at fostering and maximizing cooperation among countries with influence over parties to the Syrian conflicts to enable improved humanitarian response on the ground. Since the presidential statement was, was adopted, the number of interagency inter cross lines inside the country, cross line convoys has increased. But we continue to fall short. Both sides continue to restrict distribution of medicines and surgical supplies on the basis that they can be used to treat combatants. However, fighting continues in densely populated areas with little regard for the lives of civilians. Indiscriminate shaming is on the rise and all parties of the conflict are still targeting civilian infrastructure. It is important here to highlight the critical role played by the Syrian Arab Red Cross and volunteers to bring the necessary assistance to communities and to multiply the efforts of the humanitarian actors. Despite best efforts, regrettably, the humanitarian response remains severely insufficient compared to the growing needs. For instance, there are still 2.5 million people trapped in hard-to-reach and besieged areas who remain largely without assistance. Challenges to the response include insecurity, access constraints, administrative order, and funding shortfalls. Ongoing fighting, aerial bombardment, kidnapping of humanitarian workers, carjacking and threats are common features of the operational environment. Only a political solution will ultimately alleviate the desperate and deepening suffering faced by the Syrian civilians. Let me turn to South Sudan now. Over 200,000 people are currently internally displaced in South Sudan due to the last 15 December event. And this number, this number could easily increase if a cessation of ongoing hostilities is not reached. Heavy fighting between pro-government and opposition forces continue, especially in Unity, Apanai, and Jungle states. It is expected that despite the beginning of talks, the parties will remain focused on making military gains. There is a potential of civil unrest in every state. A political agreement may not lead to an immediate cessation of hostilities in South Sudan, as the violence has increasingly been along ethnic lines with a large group of youth thought to have revenge rather than a political agenda. Challenges include restriction on movement of affected population as a result of targeted violence 
attacks on humanitarian workers, looting of humanitarian supplies, and misuse of humanitarian assets, and potentially politicization of assistance. The country is facing a major profound crisis, and a complete readjustment of the modality of humanitarian response would need to be made in order to operate in this new environment. After those three uh, emergency crises, let me turn to Philippines, which was also a, a big event of 2013. Typhoon Ayan Yolanda in the Philippines was among the strongest storms in recorded history. This disaster has seen the largest response to a sudden onset humanitarian emergency since the Haiti earthquake and the Pakistan flood in 2010. The initial response is generally considered to have been a success in meeting the most acute needs like food, water, house, but some remain still significant in many storm affected areas and the response is uneven. Significant gaps remain in the provision of shelter and early recovery that need to be addressed as a matter of priority. Mid and long term plans have been presented by the government for addressing these priorities. So from those four um, contexts, I would like to draw a couple of conclusion points, and for sure for discussion. The humanitarian community is facing intense challenges in its own response in various contexts, and as you could see uh, from CAR, South Sudan, and, and, um, and Syria, um, the operation have to be adjusted to this particular environment. And we have to make rapidly um, uh, to take in consideration the uh, local and national reality in the context. Uh, but for sure, there are also the regional and international dynamic. Local actors and population have long been recognized as the contributor as well to the response in the immediate aftermath of an emergency. When international partners often provide the expertise to integrate these efforts into a larger national and international response. Recent years have seen communities, governments, regional organizations, and civil societies strengthening their capacity to respond to emergencies and to contribute somehow to the overall humanitarian assistance. Strengthening the links between all these different actors, international, regional, and national aid providers, and establishing adequate partnerships will therefore be essential to keeping pace with the growing needs and numbers of vulnerable people. Building on a larger network of actors and aid responders will offer new perspectives, experience, capacities, and contribution to the international response effort and to a better humanitarian analysis shared with the political decision makers. This global approach brings obviously new challenges, including aligning these new partners to the humanitarian response towards the same commitment to the fundamental principles of humanity, solidarity, and impartiality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antoine, for giving that overview of four mega crises that we saw in 2013. I was struck by your comments that have not met the needs, sadly insufficient, important gaps in response. And I think as we look further at this, we can deepen that analysis. Turning now to Sophie from MSF, welcome. Thank you. Yes. <coughs> um, and I will certainly concur with Antoine to say that uh, there is still space for improvement in our response to humanitarian crisis. It's true that 2013 has been uh, marked by a significant crisis, and uh, MSF, uh, uh, as other organizations, had to uh, expand its response to uh, Central African Republic, to South Sudan. We are largely deployed inside Syria and in the neighboring countries, and we also intervene in the Philippines uh, following uh, the, the, the disaster caused by the typhoon. Um, all these crises, uh, as well as other humanitarian ones like the DRC, uh, are certainly different in nature and uh, they, they are different in their own complexity. They have their own challenges, but they certainly have in common that the performance of, humanita of the humanitarian response can be questioned in all of them. And um, in recent years, MSF teams have been uh, increasingly frustrated and concerned uh, by the, uh, the effectiveness and the, the performance of the global aid system, including MSF performance, we're part of the system, we completely uh, acknowledge it, specifically in the response to emergencies. 
uh, either because there was, in some circumstances, a lack of actors or that the response was coming too late uh, or that it was the response was inadequate uh, compared to the needs that we were facing. So in order to objectivize this, um, this concern, we have conducted an analysis of, uh, of recent major emergencies, uh, and the case study was based on uh, the North Kivu emergency in, uh, in 2012, the South Sudan uh, refugee crisis in the late uh, 2011, and the uh, response to uh, the refugee uh, arrival in Jordan in, 20, in July 2012. And what I'd like to do uh, is share those preliminary findings with you uh, based on this case study, but not spend too much time on these specific countries because they are 2011 and 2012, and maybe try to correlate these findings with uh, some of the most recent developments that we have with, witnessed in Central African Republic, in South Sudan and Syria. So what have we found from a more granular uh, look at, uh, at those emergencies. And I have to say that this uh, analysis that we've conducted was based on our own experience, but also on uh, the analysis of external evaluation that had been made by other actors present on the ground. So what we found, and I will start with the positive note, is that clearly humanitarian assistance in, uh, in these circumstances has saved lives, uh, particularly when people were uh, uh, in immediate danger. And it's important to, to uh, distinguish this aspect because when you think of Jordan, uh, Jordan in 2012, people were not in immediate danger. Mm -hmm. People would arrive in, a, in good health, but we, it was easy to anticipate that if you uh, were not prepared to, uh, to assist them, the, the condition would deteriorate rapidly. Uh, but overall, it's clear that uh, the uh, aid deployment has allowed to assist thousands of, uh, of people, and uh, it's fair to say that a number of displaced in most of these uh, typical crises would have not survived without the presence of uh, humanitarian aid. But we do feel that uh, this aid has been uh, quite uh, both insufficient and, uh, and inadequate. And I will start with insufficient. Uh, what we realize in most of the crises where we've been, con we've been confronted to is that the coverage is, uh, is uh, insufficient and that the humanitarian sector is failing to respond adequately to the needs, and especially in hard-to-reach hard areas. And the obstacles are uh, of different nature, but the main two obstacles are the logistics. We all remember the logistic nightmare that Maban camp was in, uh, in South Sudan in 2012, uh, as well as North Kivu, and security also is a, is a major obstacle. So of course, it's for every organization to define the risk, uh, the threshold for uh, uh, intervening and to make its own risk analysis, but uh, the reality is that in Syria, in Central African Republic, in South Sudan, uh, security has been uh, uh, a justification for uh, a lower coverage, and sometimes in some circumstances, or even in places where there was no immediate danger, it was mo yeah. mostly an anticipation, as was the case in, uh, in South uh, Sudan. So what the, the first finding that we have is that actually coverage depends very much on how easy it is to reach the people. So the easiest it is, the best we do. And when it's not easy, well, we're, we're not doing such a good job. The second, uh, um, but even when uh, we operate uh, in accessible areas, when we manage to make our, to create our space of work, uh, sometimes our response is inadequate. And we've experienced this um, uh, in, uh, in a number of places. I think that Maban, again, in South in Sudan is certainly the most striking example where we could have been, we could have performed much better. It was a place where there was quite a significant presence, but the, uh, the, 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 the medical, the health outcomes were, were the worst, actually. So we haven't done such a, a good job, and uh, including for MSF, uh, we were, uh, we were a bit too late in some uh, very basic interventions in water and sanitation. Uh, and in most of the countries where we intervene, uh, there's a very uneven 
uh, reaction to, to the needs. In some places, you may have a distribution of food in the few days following the emergency, and in others, it can wait several weeks, uh, mm -hmm. even months, as was the case in Central African Republic recently when it took months before there was even an evaluation of the need. That prompted our, uh, our open letter to, uh, to the United Nations. So once we've, uh, uh, we've uh, found that the, the we could be performing better, uh, it, it's also important to, to try to understand uh, the reasons for this dysfunctioning. And um, we, we have observed uh, two main phenomena. Uh, one is related to the United Nations system, and the other one is related to the own capacity of NGOs, to, uh, including MSF, to, uh, to perform better. So when it comes to the, uh, the, the UN system, uh, we realize that when a major problem is identified in a response, uh, most of the time the UN agency is a central factor to this problem, which is very consistent with the fact that the UN has a central role to play in the response. So, of course, uh, if the UN is not functioning totally properly, it's going to be a major obstacle to the overall ability of the aid system to function. And I will give maybe three uh, areas where we think that these limitations materialize. One is uh, uh, we have observed some difficulties to mobilize the right leadership, the right skills. There are clusters that function better than others. And if you look at North Kivu and uh, South Sudan and Jordan, the three, the three countries and the crisis we looked at, the leadership was actually very good in Jordan at the time we, uh, we operated, but it was very weak in South Sudan and, mm -hmm. and, um, um, and CAR. Uh, Another aspect is that there seems to be uh, a confusion uh, in the roles of UN agencies that leads to uh, severe difficulties in taking the appropriate strategic decision making. And to give the most striking example, uh, UNHCR is expected to be a leader, a coordinator, a donor, and an implementer. It's just a, not only it's an impossible task to uh, fulfill, but also it, uh, it is potentially creating severe conflicts of interest because if NGOs uh, are coordinated by an agency, funded by that, by that same agency, their ability to challenge this agency to alert, to try to um, assess or, uh, the needs differently or to, uh, uh, to challenge the, the, the system is very limited. So we see, we see a problem there. And uh, the third materialization of the, the UN limitation, which in my view is the most uh, uh, problematic at this stage, especially when we think of Syria and Lebanon today, is that in most of the refugee crisis that we've experienced in recent years, this is the registration status as opposed to the needs that is the main determinant for assistance. So you're not assisting people because they are in need, you're assisting people because they are registered as refugees. And it's a big problem in terms of uh, this leaves thousands of people without assistance and without protection. And I'm not going to elaborate on protection because I think that uh, Ayan will do it much more eloquently than, than me. But it also creates additional vulnerabilities for the populations that are excluded from the uh, aid system and the assistance. So this is the limitations that we see in the current uh, UN, uh, UN structure. Now, uh, on the side of NGOs, there are also some very clear um, uh, obstacles and challenges that we, uh, we are facing. And the, the most important one is that we all find it extremely difficult to switch gears uh, from development or routine projects to emergency response. And it's also difficult for MSF because we also have long-term presence and very heavy hospitals to manage in uh, most of the places where there are recurring emergencies. Uh, and this has to do with uh, a genuine uh, uh, capacity issue. There is a lack of expertise in terms of responding to, to the needs. Uh, and the less reactive you are uh, in an emergency, the less equipped you will be in the next emergency to react. You really need, this is, this is something that you need to maintain and nurture within the organization. It also has to do with the structure of the organization themselves and the, uh, um, uh, the fact that existing projects are 
cannibalizing almost most of the resources. And unless you have a specific, uh, you have set aside a specific mechanism to respond to emergencies with independent funding, with uh, skilled people, with a very uh, quick capacity of response, you're not gonna be good at the emergency. Uh, and I would like to take a, a more concrete example of MSF in this because it's better to start by uh, uh, being a bit uh, self-critical and we're certainly not immune to these challenges. Uh, although a great portion of our operations, it's about more than one third of our resources and uh, operations are exclusively devoted to, to emergencies. Uh, even with that, we have found that uh, we were losing some of the fundamentals in Ida camp for example, in uh, South Sudan in 2012, we adopted a wait and see approach to water and sanitation. We thought that by taking care of the medical aspect of things, we would, we would maintain a good health situation. And in fact, it proved to be wrong. Uh, and uh, we would have certainly avoided a number of cases if we had uh, taken care of the, of the water at the beginning and not wait for other actors to, to step in. And these are fundamentals of refugee health, actually, that we ourselves were, uh, Antoine and I, when we started in MSF, we were learning these basics and fundamentals, and uh, we tend to, to forget them. Similarly, we have difficulties to adapt in, uh, uh, in less classical displacements. Uh, we faced tremendous challenges in... Uh, I remember in, uh, in Peshawar in Pakistan in 2009, trying to uh, approach and assist uh, the population who didn't want to go in the camps. I thought that we would learn a lot of lessons from this experience, but actually we haven't been able to implement these lessons or even to cope with the needs in Lebanon, for example. So urban settings are really a challenge to, uh, um, to assist uh, displaced population. So, uh, and to finish all this is to say that uh, uh, in, in our view, uh, there is nothing inevitable about good, uh, good emergency uh, response. And the fact that uh, the United Nations, and we believe it's a little bit thanks to our pressure recently, the fact that the UN has been much more visible, uh, reactive in Central African Republic and South Sudan in, uh, in the past few days, for us it's a sign that it shows that it's possible to mobilize the right skills and, to, uh, uh, and the right leadership for emergencies and to, and to do a better job. So of course, uh, I also concur with Antoine that the Philippines was certainly a success story, uh, but I think it served my, my point, actually my purpose, when it's easier, when you don't have major security issues, uh, when the logistic can be solved in a couple of days, when uh, you have a well-organized leadership and a mobilized community, then the humanitarian community is able to do a good job. But if you don't have all these good conditions, then uh, it's not as effective as, um, as we would like it to be. So just to finish my, my remark, I, uh, I'd like to um, reiterate that it's true the world is changes. It, it's true that we, we still have a lot to learn. Uh, there's a lot of space for innovation, for partnership, for connectivity, yes. But uh, we, in, in, in this world uh, that is changes, we certainly need to adapt, but we also need to improve our core function and not to forget our core, fun core function, which is about delivery, delivering aid, being on the ground, with our two feet on the ground and acting. And I think that uh, this is the only way that we can uh, improve our ability to respond to emergencies, uh, keeping in mind that our role is first and foremost to save lives, to alleviate suffering through, through our direct action. Okay. Th thank you very much, Sophie, and also for your self-critical and open attitude that I think leads to a lot of, lot of questions. But let's turn now to ICRC and Francois. Thank you, Beth, and thank you, Brookings and MSF, for hosting this event. I'd just like to take this opportunity also to state my strong and long-standing admiration for, for MSF and, and your work. Um, we, sometimes we are lonely where we work, but uh, usually we always have MSF next to us, and that's always a comfort. 
Uh, looking back at the crisis in 2013, obviously for us, Syria stands out um, very, very big for two, two main reasons. First is because of the size of the problem. I think everyone in this room is familiar with the extent of the destruction of the suffering and the needs. Um, it is one of the most violent crises in recent memory. It also has uh, a dangerous regional dimension. And as was said previously, and we can only concur, uh, many of the needs are simply not met. It is also, it stands out also uh, because in our view of uh, shocking and widespread lack of respect for the most basic norms of uh, law of armed conflict and human rights. This has of course dire consequences uh, for the civilians who are the victims of indiscriminate attacks and shellings. Uh, but also for wounded fighters, for instance, who, uh, although of course, yes, they are fighters, they are legitimate, legitimate target in, in, a, in a fight, in a war, but once wounded, they are entitled to medical treatment, and this is not happening. It also makes our work, the work of humanitarian organizations, extremely difficult. Just as an illustration, we have 32 staff of the Syrian Red Crescent Society who have been killed in the line of duty since the beginning of the conflict. We currently have three ICRC staff kidnapped, detained since October. Uh, so it is a very difficult environment to work in. We can provide some assistance. It is our largest operation in 2013. It remains our largest operation in 2014. So it means that, yes, there are things we can do, especially in the provision of water and food. Uh, we can do cross-line operations with difficulties. Just to explain the situation in Syria, you have this, sometimes this debate between cross lines and cross border operations. The ICRC has taken the option to work out of Damascus. We have been present in Damascus for, for many years. And then from Damascus to try cross the lines and bring assistance uh, into the areas controlled by the opposition. And this is very difficult. Syria remains very bureaucratic. There is also a resistance at the government level to give the green lights, the necessary uh, green lights to go into those areas. It can be done, but it's always a struggle. The other option, of course, that some other organizations have adopted is to move into Syria from Turkey and then to be operational in those areas controlled by the opposition. But then <coughs> that would deny you uh, a presence in Damascus and the areas controlled by the regime. So it's either or. You cannot have both options. It's good that organizations choose both models, so needs are covered, but as I said, many, many needs are simply not covered because of, of, their, of their size. Now, food, water, this is okay, but I'd like to focus on, on what is, is not good, and primarily it's medical assistance. Uh, there is a shocking notion entrenched in, in Syria, which came as a surprise to us, that somehow your wounded enemy does not deserve medical treatment. And this is against, of course, the most basic norms, very ancient norms in, in all laws re um, uh, regarding armed conflict. Uh, but it seems to be the case that uh, the rational being, of course, once you fix them up, they will come up and fight us back again. Uh, so it's very difficult to get the necessary authorization to, to move with medical assistance across the lines. And uh, besieged areas have been mentioned by Antoine. You have in many people uh, that don't have access to humanitarian, ac uh, to humanitarian assistance because uh, we don't get the necessary authorization and other organizations don't get those organizations either into those besieged areas. Uh, the impact of the lack of possibility to bring medical assistance has an important knock-on effect because the health system of the country has all but collapsed in many areas. So people <coughs> suffering from chronic disease also don't get or can't afford the treatment. The mortality rate has shot up really, not only for people directly wounded by the conflict, but also ordinary citizens. So this is a really uh, an important uh, tragedy which is currently without, a, without an answer. Uh, the ICRC is not only active in the field, but also politically. We try and mobilize states so that humanitarian access is improved with three main, main topics. We'd like to have access to detainees. This is also something, uh, a big disappointment for the ICRC. The ICRC normally always visits persons deprived of freedom because of a conflict. We do this in many different countries. For instance, in Iraq, we do visit 30,000 prisoners in, in Iraq detained by various branches of the government. In Syria, it is zero, and we have <coughs> thousands of persons who are currently being detained in relation to the conflict. Uh, so we are still working very hard with the government and with the opposition to get the necessary clearance uh, support to conduct those visits. We also want improved 
freedom for the movement of medical assistance and access to besiege areas. So these are the three main topics that we are pushing. We are pushing politically uh, mobilizing countries who we hope have influence, meaning that if we want to influence the government in Damascus, we would rather go and talk in Moscow and Tehran than in Washington. So we think that those countries are, I mean, have a, a better access and are listened to more carefully by the regime uh, when it comes to, to these issues. Just a word on Geneva too. We, of course, welcome a diplomatic process that would result in a, in a durable peace. Only a durable a political settlement can resolve the crisis in Syria. We just hope that the right of the Syrians to access humanitarian aid will not be, will not be forgotten in this, uh, in this process. A few words on other crises uh, that have been mentioned, Central African Republic, South Sudan, maybe just to mention them together. They are big crises. Uh, they came out uh, over the course of last year, the second half of last year. Just to mention that before those crises, those two countries were at the bottom of most development indexes, which means that, of course, the, the civilians living there, life in those countries was already very difficult, and now the violence, of course, only adds suffering on, on the population. The ICRC was present in those two countries, in CIAR since 2007, in Juba since 1980, uh, so a long time presence. So we are now in the process of upgrading our response, our presence. The challenges in those two countries are different from those in Syria, where, as I mentioned, it's sometimes of a, of a political nature. Uh, it is more of a logistical nature. It's bringing the staff. It's providing the response, but I would say, I would personally describe those two crises, CAR and South Sudan, as more conventional than what we see in Syria, which was really a, a, big, a big issue uh, tw uh, in 2013 and will be also, also next year. Uh, a word also on the, on the hurricane, because it created, on the typhoon, sorry, in the Philippines, it created a movement response. When I say movement, it is the Red Cross and Red Crescent movements. As you know, each country has a national Red Cross or Red Crescent society. So the movement has also, I think, rather well reacted to, the, to this, uh, this natural disaster. Uh, with the lead of the Philippine Red Cross, but many, many national Red Cross, Red Crescent societies, including the American Red Cross, the Canadian Red Cross, have sent expertise, hospitals, staff, but also, most importantly, money. The American Red Cross, for instance, has collected a lot of money from the American public that has been sent to the crisis to, to respond. I'd just like to say a word on Iraq. Uh, because Iraq is not going well at all. Uh, it's interesting to see how, for, uh, for instance, South Sudan has almost sucked out the oxygen out of car, and now Iraq is sucking out the oxygen out of South Sudan. It seems there's only so much space available for the attention of the media and the public for crisis, and now we happen to have many crises going on simultaneously, as you said, Beth. Mm -hmm. uh, Darfur is still bad, Yemen is still bad, Somalia is still bad, and now Syria is, of course, very, very bad, but now we tend to speak more about Iraq. But just Iraq, uh, 2013, the whole of 2013 has been very, very bad in Iraq, not only the last two weeks of the year. There were, I think, 12 weeks of 2013 where you had more persons killed in Iraq than in Syria. And now <coughs> when we work in Iraq, we still can do a lot of things, especially in terms of visit to prisoners, but we see things uh, in terms of fragmentation, in terms of risk of kidnapping, in terms of difficulties of moving around security risk that remind us of the time of 24, uh, sorry, uh, 2004, 2005. Uh, there are some possible, some links also with Syria. So we see Iraq also for this year, 2014, as a, as a very big challenge. It is one of our biggest, biggest operation. Now 2013, 2014, uh, we start 2014 with our biggest ever field budget. And uh, we know already that very soon we'll have to launch budget extensions for South Sudan, for Central African Republic, possibly for Iraq. So uh, there is also a pressure on our donors. We're very grateful that for 2013 our budget was, was met, was paid for. Uh, we will see how it goes this year. But there is also probably a limit there to what the donors can, can support. Yeah, we'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. And also just thinking about the number of large crises and the scale, you wonder how sustainable this system is in terms of mobilizing already huge amounts of money that are clearly insufficient. But Ian, let's turn to you for a human rights perspective on these. Thank you. These um, thank you, Beth. Thank you, Brookings. Thank you, um, fellow panelists. Uh, as, I, as I listened to your, um, to your contributions and reflected on both the common values that we have, the shared values, the complementarity of our values, but very different ways of working and very different contributions. I was reminded of a conversation I had recently with my, with my nine-year-old daughter who came up to me and said, 
what is it exactly that Human Rights Watch does? And before I had a chance to answer, she said, I know you complain and criticize a lot, but that's not really a job, is it? <laughs> but in, 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 in that sort of context, um, a few thoughts on, on, on the humanitarian year from one who complains and criticizes a lot, but doesn't actually do stuff on the ground the way you all do. Um, and I particularly want to <coughs> focus on Syria, CAR, and South Sudan, as other colleagues have, but obviously I'm bearing in mind ongoing crises in Somalia and Afghanistan and Congo and, and so many other places, as you've mentioned. The first point I think I'd want to make, and it's not a new point, but I, I don't think it can be overemphasized, is the fact that every one of the humanitarian crises that have been mentioned today, with the exception of the, the, the typhoon in, in, in the Philippines, is essentially a humanitarian crisis that grows out of a human rights crisis that we are seeing in all the three countries that we've particularly focused on, massive breakdowns of, uh, uh, of government capacity to protect, or in some cases, governments themselves being the major perpetrators of violations of human rights and humanitarian law. We are seeing killings, extrajudicial executions, uh, 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 indiscriminate attacks against civilians on a massive scale. Uh, forced displacement, sexual violence, attacks on health and humanitarian facilities and workers, on schools, and so on and so on and so on. It's sobering to reflect that in Syria, the big event of the year in many ways was the chemical weapons attack and the killing of an estimated 1,200, 1,300 uh, people. It was a dreadful attack, but the number of people killed in that attack was less than 1% of those who have died in the war in Syria so far and obviously only a fraction of the number in massive humanitarian need. And, and I will come to that in, in, in a minute. So for both human rights actors and humanitarian actors, these are crises that demand a response of protection and assistance, uh, and as complementary a response of protection and assistance as is possible. And that clearly can create tensions, particularly for the operational actors who have to sometimes balance out the need for access to populations in need as against the need for advocacy on the human rights violations that are driving and in many ways creating the humanitarian need. In South Sudan, it is clearly very early for us to assess what went wrong. We are still in the middle of a major crisis, but particularly since I spent three years working in South Sudan in the early and, and mid-90s, I think it is important to reflect that, the, that this was a crisis that we should have, to some extent at least, foreseen. There has been a deepening crisis of accountability in South Sudan for a long time now. Um, and I, I think it's fair to say that the International Committee missed warning signs, or at least did not respond to warning signs of growing tensions, and there was a failure to hold the government accountable. UNMISS, the UN mission in South Sudan, has over 100 human rights monitors and has done for some time, but there has been no public reporting on human rights violations, apparently because they didn't want to um, criticize a new government too much. But one has to ask the question, would a, a holding to account of the government through public reporting have helped in some way to deflect the political crisis that has generated today's humanitarian crisis. The second perspective that I think we as Human Rights Watch bring when we think about today's humanitarian crises and the response to them is the fact that, and again, maybe it's an obvious point, but one I think is very important to make, that denial of access to civilians in need of humanitarian assistance is a violation of international law. That deliberate attacks on health and humanitarian facilities are a deliberate violation of, of um, are a violation of international law. And a failure to hold account warring parties, be it in South Sudan, Syria, or, or Syria, clearly exacerbates that crisis and, 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 and exacerbates the uh, ability of the humanitarian community to reach those in need. Syria is clearly the greatest crisis in that sense because what we have witnessed, and, and colleagues have already described it very well, is a deliberate denial of access to humanitarian assistance for civilians in need, deliberate attacks on health facilities, including through barrel bombs and all sorts of other weapons, seemingly as an apparent tactic or strategy of war on the part of the Syrian government. And, and the, in particular, the denial of access 
for cross-border aid, the denial of access for aid coming particularly from Turkey, which would allow humanitarian agencies to reach massive numbers of, of, of populations in need, represents a huge violation of law and a huge exacerbation of the humanitarian crisis that my colleagues so well described. I do just want to say one word on, 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 on the violation of um, and I'm not a, a religious person, but, I, but I, I do use the word deliberately, the, sort of the sanctity of the space that is required for humanitarian health workers. We have been, um, in, in recent months, seeing in countries not in humanitarian crisis, but in political crisis, attacks on health workers in particular. Bahrain and Turkey are two countries I would mention where health workers who have treated demonstrators or opposition activists or those who've been wounded in, in clashes with police and security forces have in some cases been sentenced, particularly in the case of Bahrain, to very long periods in, in jail, accused of essentially complicity with opposition activists, even though in fact their only crime was as doctors and nurses and other health workers to treat those in need. A third reflection I would want to make is, is, is around the concept of, of responsibility to protect R2P. I'm not going to explain it because I'm sure that this audience understands R2P very well. The, the, this idea of an obligation to respond to protection and assistance needs, irrespective of, of political will, uh, uh, sorry, irrespective of, of, of politics or, 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 or uh, and only really um, commensurate with the degree of humanitarian need and objective need. And what we have witnessed, of course, in the kind of crisis that we have uh, been talking about today is a, an appalling failure to uphold R2P in an objective and a, hum in a truly humanitarian sense. Um, Syria, again, I will come back to, is, is our greatest failure. Um, when the chemical weapons were fired in Ghouta on August the 21st, the world talked about a red line being crossed. It seems that a red line has not been crossed in the case of tens and hundreds of thousands and more of children, for example, who are severely malnourished because the international humanitarian community cannot access them. The, uh, the UN Security Council has failed to do its job of providing the political cover and support for the international humanitarian community to be able to provide cross-border aid into Syria in order that all civilians in need can be reached, regardless of their political affiliation or the affiliation of those who control them. Um, and this failure to generate the political momentum and the po political will to unlock the biggest obstacle to reaching those you need. And there are many others, of course, and colleagues have, have, have described them, the, the generalized insecurity, the logistical difficulties, and so on. But it's that failure of political will that has been so striking, particularly, I think, in contrast to the way the world responded to the use of chemical weapons in, in, uh, in August, in August of, of, of last year. And the, the other example of... Um, the politicization, if you like, of the, of, the, of the concept of R2P comes when we look at the different responses to the Central African Republic and to South Sudan. The crisis in both countries is very serious. It's deeply political, deeply rooted in human rights violations, and now massive uh, humanitarian need, much of which is un un unmet. By any objective looking at the data, the, 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 it would seem that the, the conflict in CR is worse. That we've got many more people in, in need of humanitarian assistance, many more displaced, seemingly many more killed. And yet look at the different ways in which the international community has responded. Within 10, 12, 14 days of the outbreak of violence in, the, in South Sudan, the UN Security Council responded with the deployment of, or, or at least a decision to deploy 5,500 more peacekeepers 423 more police and more helicopters. Now, don't get me wrong, I am not criticizing that decision. It was a good decision. It was a speedy response to an unfolding crisis that required a swift and decisive response. But contrast that with the failure, even after many, many, many more months of massive humanitarian crisis and fighting in CAR, to make that kind of commitment. Why has that happened? There are political analysts, I'm sure, in this room who will have more nuanced answers than I will, but I would argue that part of it is because the US 
has a dog in this fight. It has a very strong commitment to South Sudan for lots of, lots of historical and other reasons. And the French, who are the main drivers of an international response to CAR, simply don't have the same influence that the, the US does to move the Security Council in the direction it needs to go. I want to finish on a more positive note, because I, I realize that between us we've been at parts a little bit depressing. So let me try and finish on a positive note. <coughs> I had a wonderful colleague, uh, we were talking about her just before with Antoine, Alison DeFore, she was our researcher for a long time on Central Africa, particularly uh, Rwanda and Burundi. She was perhaps the world's greatest expert on the Rwanda genocide. <coughs> and she used to tell a story of how in 1994, in the middle of the genocide, she was desperately trying to convince important governments to send troops to Rwanda to halt the genocide and to protect the Tutsi. And she had a meeting with Tony Lake, who was then the National Security Advisor for the Clinton administration, and who ironically is today the head of UNICEF and, and as such very involved in right. this crisis that we're describing. And she desperately tried to convince him to recommend the deployment of troops to halt the genocide, and she didn't succeed. And in the end, in desperation, she said to him, how do I convince you to do the right thing to halt the genocide? And he said, make my phone ring off the hook. Now, almost 20 years later, um, the situation is no different in many ways. He wouldn't say today, make my phone ring off the hook. He'd probably say, you know, get out on Facebook, use Twitter, uh, flood my inbox, you know, make sure my iPad sees nothing but appeals. But basically, the principle is the same. The, uh, our ability as a humanitarian community, and, and I include all of us in that, our ability as a humanitarian community to mobilize the necessary political will um, has been enhanced by the fact that we are able now to use technology and social media to tell stories, to frame narratives, to influence thinking in a way that wasn't possible in 1994. Those of you on Twitter are probably, as I am, following effectively live tweeting of both the crisis in CAR and South Sudan. On almost a minute-by-minute -minute basis, even on the train this morning, Toby Lanza, the UN humanitarian coordinator in South Sudan, is in Ben you, describing almost every half hour what he's seeing, what he's doing. We have 500,000 estimated, I haven't counted them, we have 500,000 videos on YouTube, which in different ways have, are documenting the crisis in Syria. Yeah. Some of which are unbelievably horrific and graphic because they show torture and beheadings and all sorts of things. We have an amazing capacity these days in an age of citizen journalism, in an age in which almost anybody with a smartphone and a Twitter account can become a human rights activist documenting and disseminating information about human rights abuses, international humanitarian law abuses, and abuses of humanitarian principles and humanitarian aid, <coughs> we have a new ability to tell stories, to shape narratives, and to influence policymakers that we didn't have before. And that, for me, is a very positive take out of 2013. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for introducing a positive note in this somewhat somber discussion. Before we open it up for discussion and be thinking about your questions, let me just ask you about Syria. I mean, both uh, Francois and Ian talked about Syria as an exception, as different from conventional crises. Is Syria an aberration? Are we going to see more Syria-like situations in terms of problems with access and the politicization and cross-border and disrespect for humanitarian norms? Uh, what do you think? Um, perhaps Antoine and Sophie, uh, Francois? Well, I can stop. Clearly, uh, I don't know what, whether we're going to have more Syria, but what is clear is that indeed Syria is quite uh, is quite unique, unique in its uh, own way. The scale of the destruction is uh, quite remarkable, and um, the, the the regional aspect of the crisis makes it extremely challenging challenging to to navigate, to coordinate, even operationally speaking, logistically speaking, even within a single organization. We, we are, you know, from a governance standpoint, it's already complicated to, uh, to, to, to manage an, organize, an international organization, but when you have to, uh, several teams in different countries, it's very, very complicated. So imagine at the level of the aid system, how coordination and consistency is, uh, is, is difficult. It's a very fragmented environment also, and uh, 
What we uh, also experience more drastically in Syria than in other countries is that we are facing with a country where the health system was quite sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're not dealing uh, anymore with this uh, uh, parasitic disease. We don't have many malaria in Syria, right? We have to deal with diabetic, diabetes, with cancer. And although our doctors know exactly how to treat them, our machine, logistic machine is not suited for that. We have to review all our kits. We have to work on new protocols. We had to be prepared for a potential chemical attack by drafting very quickly some contingency plans, etc. So even medically speaking, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge for, for us. And I'd like to, uh, um, to react to what Ian said about the, the visuals in Syria, because actually I agree that there's a lot of information available, but one problem that we have faced as an organization is to raise empathy about this crisis that is massively reported, but for which it's very, very difficult to have the patient voice, to have a visual, simply because it's so dangerous to bring a camera inside Syria. And so these are all challenges that we face in this country and that we, we don't face in others. Thanks. Other comments on Syria? Antoine and then Francois? Yeah, thank you. And actually, I, I fully agree with uh, Sophie and other comments that it's actually a very difficult environment. What would be very needed as well is what do we learn from this crisis? I mean, in a, in a way to prevent that we reach a certain point when we facing those challenges. And um, I think we've been, and Ian just highlighted this, uh, we've been limited in a certain number of actions that we would like to, to be seen taken. The leadership of the UN Security Council is one of the things that needs to be looked at in the learning of, of Syria. Uh, the other things is the role, and I was very pleased that uh, Francois had highlighted the essential role played by the Syrian Arab Crescent, because I think it is also another way of thinking the way we can implement the humanitarian assistance in a situation where we have a, a huge limitation of the deployment of international staff, either because we have limitation by the government or limitation by security, limitation by parties, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the last but not least is the legal framework that we're operating in. Uh, because there is, you know, the UN Security Council can certainly implement or describe or prescribe a legal framework, but also you know, the way we were implementing the humanitarian response, and then we've been talking a lot about cross-border and how much cross-border could give us a chance to do better, um, we need to discuss that as well. How come after three years, we're still struggling on this cross-border issue, particularly from Turkey, to have access to northern Syria? So I think it's very important not only to continue to explore the different ways of bringing the assistance, but parallel to this, to go back to all what we have learned and even you know beyond the humanitarian scene, meaning political, legal, uh, to see if we can do better to prevent certain crises elsewhere. Thanks. Ian, would you like to say something on Syria before we open it up? Yeah, okay, good. Just, yes, oh, Francois, uh, sorry. <laughs> just on Syria, no, we, I certainly hope we won't have too many more Syria. Uh, I think we see Syria as, uh, like other contexts, it's, uh, a convergence between what we could describe as post 9-11 and post Arab Spring. You have these poles of instability. If you remember the demonstrators in the streets of, of Tunis, of Cairo, of, of Damascus in 2011, they, they did not have a Bin Laden t-shirt and they just wanted, I mean, they were demonstrating for a, a stronger political participation and then it involved differently depending on the countries. But we see that when you have these durable poles of instability, uh, obviously, radical groups are very adept at taking use of them. And you see now, it's interesting to see the Syrian situation is very fluid as well. I mean, okay. If we had this meeting one year ago, it was rather easy, regime bad, opposition good. Now it's much more nuanced. And some of the harshest fighting is within the opposition. Exactly. Uh, and you have these links between Syria and Iraq as well. So it might well spread, but it's, uh, it's a very complex uh, situation. And uh, we think that, yes, there's an addition of different elements that makes our work extremely difficult in Syria. The resistance of the regime to get access, the, this attitude towards medical care, uh, the regional dimension that has been mentioned. So I, to be honest, I think it'd be hard to find a, a more complex and difficult situation than what we have in Syria today. Thanks. We'll now open it up for questions on any of these various humanitarian crises. I should mention that both ICRC and MSF have staff who've been kidnapped in Syria, and therefore you understand that questions won't be appropriate. Yes, questions. And we'll take three or four. There are mics here. How about one, two, 
<laughs> we'll take these first two as you're gathering your thoughts. Hi, my name's uh, Barnaby Willits King. I'm an independent consultant. Um, it's been a really interesting presentation reviewing 2013 from the point of view of responses. Um, a lot of reflection on the, the sort of continued challenges of major emergencies and, and instances of poor performance. I'd be very interested in the panel's reflections on what progress, if any, has been made in strengthening the international humanitarian system, particularly um, highlighting areas where the IASC transformative agenda has, has made tangible impact on the ground. Thank you. Great, and we'll turn to Ocha for that in a minute, but we'll have a question here. And if you could please, like a uh, former speaker did, identify yourselves. Thank you. It's uh, Mark Engman, U.S. Fund for UNICEF, uh, primarily for our colleagues at uh, OCHA and MSF, but invite the others. You mentioned protection as opposed to security, and I just wonder if you could delve into that topic a little bit further. There's a perception that it's harder to get funding and resources for protection, you know, education, child-friendly spaces, uh, dealing with gender-based violence, those types of things, uh, than it is for food, water, uh, medicines, um, and it's one of the reasons why UNICEF, and UNHCR, and others launched the No Lost Generation campaign this week in Syria to try to get donors to really focus on those particular issues. So just appreciate you getting into that topic a little bit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another question before we turn to the panelists? So we'll take this uh, young woman here and then we'll have responses. Hi, my name is... Amanda, I'm a recent graduate from the Joseph Cor Corbell School of International Studies in uh, International Human Rights. In an effort to hear just about uh, a bit about the DRC and Kiva region, I was wondering if any member of the panel has seen a difference in their ability to administer aid since the deployment of the Intervention Brigade. And if so, if you think that we will see more of these and how that, um, specifically from Lean's point of view, from Human Rights Watch, how a peacekeeping addition that has the mandate, shoot to kill, will kind of affect that in the future. Thank you. Okay, three very good and diverse questions on the transformative agenda, protection in terms of um, its relationship to security and other humanitarian assistance, and DRC and the Intervention Brigade. Who'd like to jump in? Maybe yes, Sophie? I, maybe I, I take the, the, the protection, although I think it, it's not a, an area of expertise of MSF, but I'd like to uh, clarify what I meant by, by protection and using security and not protection and vice versa. I think that for, for security, it's really uh, uh, an, an operational issue and, uh, uh, that, that, that we face in all our programs, including for patients and um, uh, populations that are uh, benefiting from uh, from the assistance, protection is a, is an issue uh, is a, is an even greater issue. We have found when we, you may have uh, a perfect system in place, but uh, and you may uh, reach so-called good standards of humanitarian practice and assistance, but at the same time you may assist population that are uh, besides uh, very much uh, abused or not under any form of legal protection. So uh, this is uh, this is a concern we have specifically for the population that is not registered and therefore who does not fall into any of these categories. Okay, okay Francois. Uh, on the same one, you, you raised the interesting issue of, of the donor's attitude towards, I mean, which program would they fund and the earmarking. And for us, it is, it is, and I think for all of us, it's, the earmarking is a big challenge. And of course, we try to have uh, as little or as loose as possible an earmarking. Uh, but when we devise a, a response, a humanitarian response in a given context, there will be always a strong protection element, assistance, uh, dissemination of international humanitarian law, and we try to sell the, the package. And uh, I think, to be honest, I don't have the, the impression that we have various aspects, various programs that are more better funded than, than others. Either the whole thing makes sense or it doesn't, because, and we would try and resist uh, a near marking down to the level of the program. Uh, a number of countries, including the U.S., are very generous in their very loose earmarking. They are this for Africa, and then it allows us also to fund crises in totally forgotten crime. I mean, who would pay specifically for our prison visit in Madagascar, who happened to save hundreds of lives, literally, because people are dying of hunger there? And it's because of this very loosely earmarking fund that we can, we can afford to pay for these activities. Antoine, has the transformative agenda made a difference on the ground? Yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, you... you 
you, you put actually your, your point on something that has been launched about three years ago, and the, the first question was related to have we done you know better, and particularly now under this what we call the transformative agenda, highlighting a certain number of issues and to bring the proper leadership that actually Sophie and others were actually commenting on the uh, interagency standing committee, the leadership of the humanitarian coordinator including not only the UN, but also, of course, I mean, those who are actually associated to, uh, to the Interagency Standing Committee as uh, the NGO Consortium and the family of the Red Cross and Red Cross and Movement. I think it's, uh, it's very uh, important to see that for the last two, three years, we've been actually looking at, do we have the right leadership in certain countries? And to be honest, as you know, the humanitarian leadership is actually still very much related to the UN leadership, meaning the resident coordinator system. So there is a lot of emphasis on our relations with UNDP and the UN uh, development group to make sure that uh, you know the leadership is the right one, up to the point that um, uh, and Valerie Amos, as you know, Undersecretary General, but also as the emergency relief coordinator leading the interagency standing committee has actually pushed the UN colleagues to review whether we have the right leadership in certain crises, to change it, to, to make it stronger, and to have the right person at the right time. And this is one of the issue of the transformative agenda. The coordination issue is, is even, and do we have, and it was one of the questions, do we have the right system? Uh, I think it's also uh, something that we're looking at not only the coordination with the um, with those that we've been working on, I mean, working with for the last 20 years or more, but uh, also the coordination with a certain number of actors who do come uh, and in in some of the crises and actually contribute to the assistance. Uh, maybe we may not label this humanitarian assistance, but nevertheless, they are an actor contributing to the assistance. And we've seen this in Somalia with, a, with even the, organiza the Organization of Islamic Cooperation had actually appointed a humanitarian coordinator for the OIC to function in Somalia to coordinate the organization's effort to respond to the assistance in Somalia. So I think coordination is even beyond the usual coordination. We're looking at coordination in a more holistic way. And the last component of the transformative agenda, and you will find actually more, more literature on this in our website, is the accountability to affected population. We do feel that we neglected this uh, for the last 20 years of operation of, uh, uh, of the coordination system of the, uh, of the, of the IC, that uh, it is a domain that we feel that's more important, particularly at the time that we do have a lot of new tools, and Ian was referring to this, how much uh, you know, the communities receiving assistance are also commenting on the assistance that they are actually receiving. Uh, I mean, many times I remember uh, you arrive in the meeting when I was in, in Sudan, in, in, in Darfur, when you have a consultation with the IDPs, uh, immediately what you say is actually tweeted to the political leaders of the IDPs in Paris or wherever, uh, and they receive a response, do say this. So it's, uh, it's very interesting because I think it's not anymore a, 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 you know, a local consultation nor a national consultation. It's becoming a regional and international consultation to, to address a local problem. Uh, and that also contributes to the complexity of the response. Uh, hence, the engagement with the communities, with the affected population is key to have a very transparent relationship of what we're trying to achieve. So the transformative agenda is, is trying to address those uh, in a more broader way of reflecting on do we have the right system, and I'm sure most of you have heard about the commitment to organize the World Humanitarian Summit, mm -hmm. exactly in that perspective of thinking whether we have the right system to respond to the humanitarian, uh, humanitarian crisis. So it's, it's right broad. I think transformative agenda is one of the steps, and I, I, I'm happy to, to, to discuss more on this later on. But um, just to, it's to, to say that uh, the technology, the, uh, the awareness of how humanitarian assistance should be delivered uh, by particularly the affected population is, needs to be taken on board. And a comment on Twitter uh, could be constructive, but could be very destructive to the humanitarian assistance. So this is also things that we need to look at. 
Thanks, Ian. You want to talk about DRC and intervention beginning? Yeah, and just maybe just a, a word on the on the, uh, the first question too. Um, uh, I, I, Twenty-nine years ago today, I got on a plane from London to Khartoum. It was my first humanitarian job. I was working. I was sent to work in a refugee camp on the uh, Sudan-Ethiopia border, which at that point was the biggest humanitarian crisis of the day. So I'm feeling nostalgic. Um, I'm also feeling positive because I do think that. When I reflect back over those years and having worked within and very closely with the international humanitarian system, it has developed massively uh, in many, many, many positive ways. The professionalism, the standards, the coordination, the structure, there is much yet to be done. And we've heard some very critical and self-critical reflections today, but, uh, but I think it, it's been hu a hugely important step forward. Um, and one, I think, uh, important development in 2013 that I do want to flag because I think it will continue to be extremely important for the evolution of humanitarian work, particularly in the context of kind of complex emergencies and human rights crises that become humanitarian crises, has been the work that has come about as a result of the reflections on the failure of the UN system to deal with the Sri Lankan crisis, the end of the, the, the civil war in Sri Lanka. Uh, and the UN, I think, has gone through an important period of reflection on its failure um, to address, uh, to uh, protect the civilians who were caught up at the end of that conflict. Tens of thousands of people were killed. The international response was extremely poor. Um, and I think that the initiative that Ban Ki-moon has recently launched to really strengthen the, 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 the way in which the system responds, not just through the humanitarian mechanisms, but also politically and, and through human rights and other mechanisms to ensure greater coherence with rights at the center and protection at the center is extremely important. On the intervention brigade, I mean, it's, it's a very good and important question. It, it raises many questions about the role of peacekeepers in, in protecting civilians in, in, uh, in very vulnerable situations. I mean, just a couple of reflections. Um, I think the, the growing willingness uh, of the Security Council to consider more robust mandates for peacekeepers is important, uh, as is the... Um, the, the growing willingness to, to, to consider the kinds of resources that allow faster and more proactive responses. Uh, the fact that as part of the UN Security Council's response to South Sudan, even very quickly after the crisis generated, it included helicopters for rapid deployment. That was very important. There's been talk of using drones in, in Eastern Congo as a way of monitoring uh, uh, troop movements that would allow the UN system to better uh, uh, anticipate attacks on civilians and, and respond to them. So there's much there that is positive. Obviously, there is enormous concern on the part of many, including Human Rights Watch, to ensure that rules of engagement are very, very clear, to ensure that international humanitarian law and human rights are at the heart of the response. It's one thing to to take aggressive measures to prevent peop uh, armed men from, from killing civilians. But obviously, uh, it's important that, that uh, those powers not be abused and they work within a very, very clear framework, which means very careful vetting of troops. It means very clear rules of engagement. It means proper training in, 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 uh, in human rights and humanitarian law and so on. So there's lots to be uh, optimistic about, but clearly many, many cautions to ensure that it's handled well. Francois, did you want to... Maybe just to, to add on, on an important point made by Antoine about the social media. Mm -hmm. uh, it's true that one thing we have not fully integrated yet is that social media not only allow people in Washington, London, and Paris to be human rights activists, but also in Aleppo, in, in Bangui, mm -hmm. and in Juba. And uh, the beneficiaries now have a voice. And to be honest, we still have to get used to this. In, in 20 years ago, we did a distribution. You issue a press release. You say, we've, we've been there. We've distributed this and this. And now today, if you do that, you have people who tweet and say, no, it's not true, I haven't seen them, et cetera. Right. So these, these, these things can be misused, can, you, can right. be abused also, of course. Yeah. They, they, it can be manipulative. Uh, but it's, uh, I think it's very positive and very important, and it's here to stay that the beneficiaries now have clearly a voice. Uh, and this is something that is new. That accountability that comes from yes. sometimes from social media. Other questions, comments? Oh, one, two, three, four. <coughs> we'll start with David. You can introduce yourself. My name is uh, David Hollenbach. I'm from the Center for Human Rights at Boston College, although here in Washington for the year. I'm interested in the issue of mobilizing public opinion and the effectiveness that it can have. You brought up, Ian, uh, obviously. 
I, a, a case that has meant a lot to me was going back into the mid 2000s uh, when uh, the US became quite involved in putting pressure on to bring about the comprehensive peace uh, in South Sudan. There was a lot of pressure behind that coming from various factors here in the United States. And it made a big difference. Uh, but it, it just went into a nosedive afterwards. And the uh, effort to follow up on it, I don't think, really happened the way it should have. The monitoring and accountability and the other things that were brought up about what was going on in South Sudan. And I'm wondering, uh, do you think that's because the people who were interested in South Sudan just stopped sending enough tweets to the appropriate offices? Or is it because of the way the government uh, was lack of response? Or I'm interested in thinking more about those kinds of initiatives and how they might be more effective in the future. Another example of a, of a, of a response which is obviously extremely controversial uh, it has to do with the use of the chemical weapons in Syria. What Barack Obama did was he threatened war. And we got uh, a change of policy regarding chemical weapons in, in, uh, in, in Syria. I was not in favor of his particular threat, but I'm very pleased with the way it worked out. Uh, I'm just wondering, again, how we look at these dynamics that might bring about some sort of greater accountability and follow through. I'm interested to hear your reflections about that. Thank you very much. And we had another, who else was over here? Okay, woman back in the back there. Hi, my name's Athena Vescuzzi. I just returned from one year with um, MSF in Myanmar. <laughs> and uh, I was there, we, it was a, a very low, level crisis, not the um, amount of deaths or anything, or chemical weapons or anything dramatic, but persistent, um, cruel persecution of a population and uh, that had a lot of the things that you've highlighted, um, balancing um, advocacy um, with the need to maintain access. And um, I was just wondering if you could um, comment on what you think the role of um, uh, international actors um, can be in preventing these kind of um, situations, the treatment of ethnic minorities in, in Myanmar from um, escalating into the kind of crisis. I think there's also um, some of the things that have been mentioned about South Sudan, the need to coddle a government um, that, that may be doing some good things, um, but is clearly doing some things that are not so good. Um, Human Rights Watch has done some wonderful reports on the situation. Um, but it's also, I understand, holding its annual meeting in Myanmar this year. So just if you had ideas on what we can do to prevent, there's many of these situations all over the world that have the potential to escalate into um, more bloodshed. Thank you, Athena. We have a question over here, one and then here. I'm Bjorn Schneider from the Center for Health and Gender Equity. Um, we all know that a huge portion of the violence experienced by women and girls is sexual in nature. And the UN has made some great strides this year on addressing that and incorporating it in some tangible ways into to how we're talking about responses to violence. What are we seeing on the ground? Um, and are we any closer to sort of mainstreaming reproductive and sexual health responses in how women are experiencing humanitarian aid? Thank you very much. And this gentleman here. Hi, my name is Chip Lyons with the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. I'd like to ask the panelists um, about the Central African Republic and just what you see as possible next steps by the United States. Several of you commented on different elements. Uh, lack of action by the Security Council. Um, a, a number of elements, I don't need to repeat your points. Um, but there was a, relatively speaking, quite high level visit by Ambassador Powers. Um, is that leading to something? Um, we have Ambassador Powers and her really very strong uh, track record around human rights issues. Uh, the person whose phone uh, is supposed to ring off the hook is now uh, Susan Rice instead of Tony Lake. Her own uh, expertise and commitment to the continent 
Is that gonna add up to something? Are you anticipating um, steps there? You talked about the relative influence of the United States versus France. You talked about the scale of the problem in the Central African uh, Republic. Unfortunately, at least in this country, I think um, the problems have to get that severe before the Central African Republic rises up on a political or a media interest list. But unfortunately, those conditions um, have come together. So what do you anticipate, if anything, and I know none of you speak for the United States, but you're, you have lots of contacts and plan and discuss. Do you see the United States doing something material, important, tangible for the CAR in the next number of weeks and months? Thanks. Thank you, is there a final question? Okay, well why don't we, we've got four good questions. How to sustain public opinion, particularly in the case of South Sudan. What's the role of international actors in preventing that ongoing persecution of ethnic minorities or preventing the escalation of that into widespread atrocities? Um, is there progress with sexual violence on the ground? Has this been mainstreamed? And what can and will the U.S. do in Central Africa Republic? Who'd like to jump in? Antoine. Wow, that's a really tough question. <laughs> but um, um, just to start on, and I think the two related is how to better influence and also after that I'm going to discuss more about what uh, a very specific member state can do on situation like uh, CAR. But um, I think in the, as you were referring, you know, to some of the campaigns uh, uh, around Sudan and actually I was in Sudan at the time that there were, you know, a huge uh, campaign here and particularly Save Darfur and all this, this the type of advocacy campaign led to come up with a very specific uh, agenda, which was to raise the profile of what's happening in Darfur. But at the same time, um, this coordinated with the uh, humanitarian agenda. And I think we need to be very careful that some of the opinion, public opinion campaigns are not actually becoming an impediment for the realization of the humanitarian agenda. And uh, I had discussed with uh, Safe Darfur, and I was actually invited at the time to participate to some panels where we could we could certainly explain that this work of mobilizing is, is very critical, and I think you're absolutely right. Making sure that the public is better informed about the situation in very specific countries makes a difference, because it's not about only a few people, you know, in capital cities that will will make a difference, but it's also making sure that the public is also a pusher to mobilize the political leaders and to ask accountability against their own you know, choice that they have made, not only for a national agenda, but for an international agenda. So I think it is very important. But um, it's very also critical that any advocacy campaign that are led to mobilize the political leaders are not becoming also uh, by themselves uh, a system of mobilization that is not anymore related to the critical issues that we're witnessing on the ground. Up to the point that uh, in my conversation with the Sudanese government, um, is that they were associating some of the humanitarian actors as the campaigners, uh, and it became extremely difficult to, to convince them that it's not because you are a U.S. organization working in Darfur that you are necessarily a U.S. organization contributing to the Save Darfur, asking for regime change and, and uh, the ICC and other things. Uh, and so um, I, I'm, in, I'm very much for campaigning, but I would suggest that it's actually strategic influence rather than campaigning because sometimes uh, we lose track of what we're trying to achieve and we could actually be, again, another layer of complication for those who are going to be on the ground and add a, a security or, uh, you know, uh, a problem for, for the actors. Um, I thought it was extremely, uh, and you're absolutely right, the fact that uh, Ambassador Power has decided to go to CAR uh, is, is extremely powerful. First, because she will come back very informed and she could certainly have power at the Security Council to say, I was there and I met a number of leaders and I can tell you from first hand that it is not acceptable what's happening, etc. So I think uh, it's back again, mobilizing with the right information, her peers, it's, it's, it's critical. Now, um, I, I can tell that the Security Council has made some decisions to look at the transfer of the MISCA towards the DPKO mission. 
what is very important is that whenever it would happen in the framework of this transformation, is that the justification for me is critical that we need to address the security uh, uh, process inside uh, car and not getting into an argumentation that we need a PKO mission in car because we want humanitarian assistance. I mean, humanitarian assistance has its own track. It's very important to focus on the security and we hope that the, uh, the negotiation will come up with a, with a good formula to improve the security inside CAR, and that would certainly help the, uh, the environment for uh, the humanitarian organizations to operate. But um, I, um, I, I want to insist on this point that at time that information flows so quickly, uh, um, social media can actually create platforms of discussion. Sometimes they can be extremely helpful and sometimes they can be extremely counterproductive. And, and I think it, it requires, and it's very difficult to manage that. Uh, it requires to, to make sure that those who are going to put the, the message uh, up front are also in consultation with organizations who are actually delivering the assistance inside the country in order to avoid uh, a mismatch between the message to do certain things and then the fact that it can actually be not necessarily the solution that the humanitarian would like to see in that particular country. Thank you. Other responses? Francois? No, on sexual Any? violence? Uh -huh. Yeah, sexual violence is, <coughs> is uh, underreported. Uh, it is a very widespread problem. Uh, this year, 2014, we have launched a specific appeal uh, to address uh, the consequences of sexual violence in conflict. Uh, it's also an important internal exercise. We need to brief, to sensitize, to train our own staff. This is an issue that is surrounded by many taboos in many different cultures. Victims don't come out easily. And even we discovered that our staff, these are not usually the first thing you ask, the first question you ask. People tend to stay away from these issues if they can. And now clearly the instruction to our staff is that by default this happens. It's not something that you must look. I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, in every situation of armed conflict today, uh, there is a, a notion uh, of sexual violence. We have come up with innovative, with very specific program responses in places like DRC, like Colombia, and we try to, to look at other places. But just to answer that now, it's, it's fully integrated, uh, but it also requires an important internal uh, exercise in terms of sensitization and training of our own staff. This is not an area where it's easy to, to go. Thank you, Ian. A couple of things to the lady for, uh, who was in from, uh, from Burma, uh, as we call it. Um, thank you for raising the question of the Rohingya. I'm really happy. I wanted to, to talk about them, um, but I ran out of time, so I'm really thrilled that you, um, that you raised the issue. Because I think it raises in incredibly important questions. As you say, it's not a humanitarian crisis on the scale of Syria or Central African Republic, perhaps. But in terms of the depravity and the brutality and the fundamental discrimination that is driving this humanitarian crisis, it is extremely important, particularly at this time of transition in Burma, when the international community uh, uh, at governmental level and also the private sector are seeking to embrace the new Burma. Um, we have tried to both welcome the changes that have been made, and there have been some very important changes, but also to insist that there's a little bit more stick and a little, little less carrot in the international response because there are still some incredibly troubling uh, uh, patterns of governmental behavior, and perhaps the most egregious is the treatment of the Rohingya, the fundamental problem of refusing to, to grant them uh, uh, um, citizenship, and then the massive discrimination, I including acts of extreme violence and brutality, which in many cases are now have forced them um, out of the country. Uh, and as you, I'm sure you know better than I, stories now in recent days of um, trafficking camps in Thailand where Rohingya who fled seeking refugee status are being uh, further abused now. So extremely important to maintain the pressure on, uh, on the new government, and particularly on Aung San Suu who has not been good on this issue or strong on this issue. She's running for president in 2015, and she doesn't want to support uh, a minority which is extremely unpopular with the majority um, of Burmese. Um, on Central African Republic, it's, it's an incredibly timely question. We're expecting today, in fact, it may have happened since we started talking, that the president's sort of being forced out today. Very strong rumors that he would be, he would be resigning today. Um, enormous fears about what kind of power vacuum that will create and who would, 
who, you know, who would rule the country if, if it's in fact true that he, 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 he does stand down today. Um, I, I completely agree that uh, uh, Samantha Power's visit to CR was very important. It was very important politically. It was very important symbolically. What we have not yet seen and what we want to see at Human Rights Watch is uh, to take that visit to the next level and to get the support of the Security Council to turn the current uh, a U-led and French peacekeeping mission into a UN one. We believe that only a UN peacekeeping operation can bring the mandate, the experience, the expertise, the professionalism to provide the security and the protection of civilians and the creation of conditions for humanitarian workers to be able to, to, to work effectively. I, I don't know enough about the dynamics within the US government between the UN mission and the, and the State Department and NSC as to exactly where the debate currently is. Um, but we're very much hoping that the pressure will continue. There's real fear, uh, and we've all been reflecting on the limited attention span that South Sudan has actually deflected attention away from CR in the last couple of weeks. Uh, there is, as that understandably, you know, South Sudan is much more on the agenda here in Washington than, than CAR. So it was unfortunate that sort of around the time that Ambassador Power was going to, to Bangui and drawing attention to the issue, that there then was a deflection of focus to, to South Sudan. But we've been uh, lobbying hard here in DC and trying to say, great that you took the action you did on South Sudan. It's vital that the same thing happen. Um, we're trying to make people's phones ring off their hooks, and hopefully others will do it. Um, on the, the, the gentleman from Boston College, um, I realize we're running out of time, so I'm going to stop in one second, and maybe we can talk afterwards. I mean, very, very important question about, about mobilizing public opinion, about how one can use modern forms of media to drive public opinion in, 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 the, in the right way. Clearly, South Sudan's been a very important issue here in... In, in, in Washington, um, one fears that perhaps um, South Sudan was so set up as the anti-Khartoum that the public attention didn't generate the right kind of scrutiny and the right kind of critical support <laughs> that would have been needed. And that now it's, I'm not saying it's too late, but it's, it's clearly a much more difficult time to exert that kind of scrutiny now. Thank you, Ian. Sophie, would you like to add a final word? Uh, then maybe I would link the first question and the fourth one. And um, when it comes to mobilizing public opinion, what we have learned actually from the HIV AIDS fight was uh, interesting for MSF because we realized that the reason why it, the, the first phase of this fight was so successful was that uh, there was a convergence of different factors. There was a scientific momentum with the arrival of antiretroviral treatment, there was a political opening, and there was a strong mobilization. And although the factors are different uh, in, in different crises, we also see that whether it is the chemical uh, weapon issue or, or Central African Republic, it's never just because you're gonna mobilize that it's gonna work. It's never just because there is a, uh, an opening from, from one country. It's really this convergence that needs to happen. So the, the, the lesson for us is that we absolutely need to be extremely opportunistic and keep fighting and try to uh, create our space and, and not even in the most desperate situation, uh, we need to continue to, to advocate and try to move the needle. CAR is an extremely good example. I was there uh, in 2010 for an evaluation of, the, uh, of our programs, and it was part of a broader studies about trying to uh, um, alert the international community about the health status of CAR, uh, and we're working with ICRC on, uh, on this, I remember, because we had alarming signals of health. And then after my trip, I went to DC, and we had numerous meetings to try to mobilize the US government. And it, it had zero impact. We were absolutely desperate. Now, two years after, because of, of course, we had to wait for this dramatic situation to occur, but there is clearly more funding to Central African Republic. There is a willingness of the US government to, uh, uh, to mobilize and to play a constructive role in this, uh, in this crisis. So the lesson for us is really, as uh, activists and aid actors, we need to continue and try to leverage every possible opportunity uh, to, uh, to advocate for this crisis. Thank you very much, and thank all of you for coming, and please join me in thanking the panelists.